And to discuss this further, I'm joined from London by Dr Andreas Krieg, who's the Associate Professor in Defence Studies at King's College in London. Doctor, thanks very much for your time. We're yet to hear what Qatar's official response to this list of demands will be, although we do have an indication. Is there any chance that Qatar will comply with these demands? Absolutely not. Um, this demand was never sent out to actually be um, complied with. I think this list of uh, demands was compiled as a means to tell Qatar you have to follow suit 100%. Um, we want you to give up your sovereignty in both domestic and foreign affairs um, and come into under the umbrella of Saudi influence in the same way as other smaller countries in the region have done before. And um, there doesn't seem to be any way for the, for the Emirates or Saudi Arabia to be willing to make any compromises. And um, Qatar is, make, is willing to make compromises. But the, if you look at the list of allegations, no country with, with no sovereign state would ever comply with these kind of demands because it would basically mean giving up foreign and defense policy. Um, it's a ma major interference even in like uh, closing down a broadcaster such as Al Jazeera. And um, this is obviously un unacceptable. And I, I think the international community is quite with Qatar on this one on saying that these demands are disproportionate. Qatar absolutely will not comply with those demands and that's their response, their official response. What then from that other group of nations? Sorry, can you repeat this again? If Qatar, if they definitely will not comply to that list of demands as they stand, what will be the response from the other group of nations? Again, this is a, there's a huge question mark. The problem that the that the Saudi and UAE-led coalition have is that they escalated very quickly from zero to almost 100, and there's very little uh, room now to further escalate. Um, without actually going to war. And uh, we're already in a situation, this, this, this kind of embargo is, if you look at the ge geographical reality on the ground, this embargo is very similar to a, an, an escalation close to war. So there's very, very little they can do at this point. There, are, there, were, there were talks in the UAE over the last couple of days to potentially confront states as well as companies with a choice of either doing business with the UAE or Qatar, which means that if a company does business in Qatar, they will not be allowed to do business with the UAE, which I think is a very self would be a very self-destructive mean, uh, means for both Saudi Arabia and the UAE. So I, I, I don't think that this is a, a viable option. Um, but, you know, clearly, I think, um, what the GCC is moving towards. Saudi Arabia will push if Qatar doesn't comply, will push for Qatar to be isolated in the GCC, even expelled from the GCC. But for that, you would need the full um, approval of all member states. And there could be another option like uh, what happened to Egypt in the 1980s after their peace deal with Israel to ban Qatar from uh, the Arab League. So this would be probably the potential next step. A military intervention at this point, uh, in this current context with Turkish and especially more than almost 10,000 US troops on the ground in Qatar, I don't think a military escalation is on the books. If this list of demands was made without the expectation that they would be accepted outright, why were they given in the first place? Because, you know, you have to understand this in the wider context. This is a clash of narratives between Saudi Arabia and the UAE. On one hand, they do want to return to an authoritarian Middle East, something pre-2011, pre-Arab Spring. And they hoped that by silencing Qatar, um, they would be able to achieve this. And they also hoped that Donald Trump, who is someone who is supporting this idea of an authoritarian uh, of authoritarian stability in the Middle East, going back to pre-2011, which obviously is not possible, they hope that with the support of Donald Trump, they would be willing by escalating so massively um, to basically push Qatar into submission uh, within a few days. And that obviously didn't happen. And also Donald Trump or the entire US administration has been quite ambiguous of how, how far they want to go in supporting the Saudi UAE coalition. And um, in, at, at this point, I don't think it's in Donald Trump's interest, actually, to uh, push this any further because he needs a united GCC to take on the, the, the U.S. interest to tackle these U.S. concerns, which is ISIS and, um, and Iran. So the Donald, the Donald Trump and the administration, the U.S. administration, haven't really come around to support this initiative. And I think that was a massive strategic miscalculation on the side of the Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. The demands about the Al Jazeera network, do you believe that it's possible that that network will be closed and how significant for the region would that be? 
Oh, that'd be very significant. I mean, um, Al Jazeera exists already for more than 20 years, and Al Jazeera is somewhat the um, a beacon of freedom of speech in the region. And it's the first uh, transnational Arab news channel that was broadcasting across the region uh, without actually having an editorial that was tied to state authorities. Until 1995, 1996, there wasn't any outlet, any satellite news network in the region that would broadcast in Arabic uh, with, uh, that was independent of the involvement or censorship of the state. And here you have Al Jazeera, which until this day, despite this, the, the crisis going on, the, there is a still a huge um, distinction between the editorial work at Al Jazeera and what the state of Qatar is doing, which is quite unprecedented. I think there is a lot of rallying around the flag in the in, in the world of journalism internationally, in the West, in the UK, in the US, but also in Australia, saying we have to stop this initiative because Al Jazeera is the voice for the voiceless. If you clamp down on this, this is not just a major interference in the sovereignty of Qatar, but it would be, mean the end of freedom of speech in the Arab world, and that is quite significant. All right, Dr. Andreas Craig, we'll have to leave it there. Thanks very much for your time. Thank you.